Greetings, it is I, Tantus Naravan Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. It is time to continue my discussion on the clans and bloodlines of Vampire the Masquerade in the world of darkness. Today we have the next of the independent clans, the Giovanni. Now the Giovanni are an independent clan. They are the usurpers of the Cappadocians. They are the youngest of the clans of King. Masters of potence, dominate, and necromancy. They live for both financial gain and necromantic power. I should say, unlive, though. They are both a clan and a family. Their weakness is that when they bite and feed upon another, it does more damage than normal, so they have to worry about possibly killing off someone when they are feeding upon them. Now, the clan's antediluvian is Augustus Giovanni. He actually diabolized his sire, Cappadocius, in order to become a third generation. The family origin dates back to Rome, where it was a merchant family known as Ivanovus that actually wanted to learn more about bringing the dead back. So they dabbled into effective, they were mortals that dabbled into effectively the early portions of necromancy. With the fall of Rome, they moved towards Tuscany and settled in Vienna. There they continued to study the depths of necromancy, what would eventually become some of the necromantic paths that the Giovanni clan actually followed. So it was about the 13th century that they changed their name actually to Giovanni, with a slightly different spelling, and it was the 15th century where we find the modern spelling of Giovanni actually becoming into existence. Now it was around 1005 that Augustus Giovanni was a prominent member within the family and a mastery of many of the necromantic arts. He knew about vampires. He had learned about them. He had gotten offers from many clans in order to be embraced into them, effectively because they were mortals that studied necromancy. They were effectively a branch that was very linked to undead and, of course, vampires. The Cappadocians gave him the best offer of becoming a third generation, basically waking up their antediluvian from Topor and using some of his blood to embrace Augustus. The thing is, the Cappadocians, as they were called the Clan of Deaths, already studied necromancy. It was one of their disciplines. They wanted more necromantic information for their goals. They wanted better information because their goals were basically meeting a deadlock. And so they were trying to embrace mortals that had this. And Augustus proved to be a great expert. Once he was embraced, he went about embracing his entire family. Creating a subgroup, a bloodline within the Cappadocians, known as the Giovanni, and he did his best to keep his group separate from the rest of them. Now, when it came to the Renaissance, Giovanni, Augustus, he enacted his plan. Effectively, they diablerized um, Cappadocius and his most important, highest childer by, of course, Augustus himself diablerizing Cappadocius and his second command basically eh, diablerizing Cappadocius is second in command. This happened in 1444, and then the purge of the Cappadocians began. By 1518, the majority of them had purged out, and it was this point in time that the Giovanni were able to effectively negotiate a peace with the Camarilla, effectively cementing themselves as the true successors to the Cappadocian and a clan in their own right. That they had a, <laughs> effectively an antediluvian, and though they were diablerists and kind of seen in a negative light, they were able to get that position. It was this point in time that Augustus outlined the majority of their plan. They were going to follow, for one, the Cappadocians' plan. The Cappadocians planned to basically gain control of wraiths, control them completely and utterly by breaking down the shroud, which was the sort of boundary between the living world and the world of wraiths, the world of sort of the dead. By breaking down this down boundary and making it much easier, they were able to manipulate and control wraiths to a much greater degree. So from then on, 1528 onwards, the clan, the Giovanni, opted out of all other vampire politics, pretty much. They kept to themselves. They didn't want to get involved with the war between the Camarilla and the Sabbat, which was already going on at this point in time. They had three great goals. First off, greater necromantic power. Second off, greater finances. A lot of what they were needing for their necromantic research involved around needing a lot of money. Hence why financial house was very important. And lastly, eliminate the remaining Cappadocians. They wanted to get rid of the only other vampires that might know their plans because the Cappadocians' plans was the same thing they're attempting. 
and what they were attempting probably wasn't going to be good for other vampires, so eliminate the people that might blab on them. When we hit the Victorian age, the Giovanni used this as an excuse to spread. Uh, bloodlines from their family had spread out across the world, and they began to embrace them into the actual family, basically spreading themselves off across the globe, making them more widespread, especially in places like the U.S., where they could gain some financial influence during this time period. They, in fact, managed to keep themselves relevant within, cam uh, within vampire politics because they had so much finances they could use to influence mortal society. As much as vampire politics is between two vampires, mortal society has a direct influence. And since they had such great influence, they basically were able to keep up this important position with all of vampire society. Now, they did have some major setbacks with the two world wars, but when it came into the modern nights, they were riding high. They had effectively eliminated the last of the Cappadocians, kind of purging the last of that clan, getting themselves in a position they didn't have to worry about them. They had also managed to expand the family to much of the globe, so they had members spread out that they could easily use for a lot of influence. Things went awry, though. Three events. First off was the arrival of the Harbinger of Skulls, a group that is seemingly bringing the vengeance of the Cappadocians down upon the Giovanni that is hunting them down a powerful enemy against them. Second off was the Sixth Great Maelstrom. The Maelstroms were basically effects that were hitting the Shroud and affecting the basically connection between the spirit world, the world of the dead, the realm of the living. This effectively made it more difficult to use some of their abilities. It was a disruption, but that was indeed caused by the third thing, the Week of Nightmares. The week of terrible things that occurred when the Ravenos Antideluvian rose from Topor and basically went to war with the Technomancers, eventually being killed, but not before effects that basically were signaling perhaps even global destruction in Armageddon for pretty much every creature across the world, kind of occurred. Basically, it was the first of the Antideluvians to actually rise from Topor and be awake during the modern days leaving in a position where the Giovanni are still suffering from these setbacks and hoping to regain themselves to the position that they want to enact their plans. So, when we talk about the Giovanni and their organization, they are a series of interconnected families spread across the world. As I said, they are all families, but they come from different places. When you think the stereotype that most vampires think of them being Italian, that's incorrect. There are families that basically have that direct descendants from various walks of life throughout the world. Granted, you know, you could always trace back that little core of Italy in all of them, but they've integrated such into these areas that they are effectively native to them now. These split between major families, which are the more important ones, and minor families, each of them having different influence over all the entire clan. The family is basically the cross between a corporation and a mafia, and it acts very much so like that. Favor within the clan is based again around performance, and backstabbing of many different kinds is actually something day-to-day -day that members of the clan have to worry about. Now, family members who aren't embraced basically don't know about anything. They're shrouded from it, so the clan itself has its own version of the masquerade. They just think their family is weird, aside from the backstabbing between all the members and the incest that happens more often than it really should. Beyond that, they do not know about the, the cannibalistic, blood-drinking necromancers, which are the core of the family. Yeah. Now, the group is basically governed over by a, a group of elders, a council of them, known as the Azianti. Now, this doesn't mean that every elder is a member of them. Elders are still respected, even if they aren't member of the Azianti. Now, they are, as I said, very family-oriented. This actually means, once a Giovanni has been embraced, they may actually try to influence and look after their descendants for some time, for generations to come. Now, there is one variant of them, the Primacine, which are said to be sort of throwbacks to the Cappadocians. They actually have the pale sort of skin that the Cappadocians have. And they're able to learn the Mortis Path of Necromancy without a teacher. This has led some to sort of distrust them, but so far they have been indeed loyal to the family. Now, when we talk about the Giovannis, they're effectively a family of ghouls. Ghoul families do exist that are out there, especially when we talked about the ones under the Semiche. But 
they tend to be as repulsive in degenerate as those families, but more subtle. They're very subtle about it and hide a lot of that terribleness that exists within them. They also tend to be incredibly sadistic. In order to control race, it requires incredible fortitude, but it also requires you to effectively break them down. And using psychological warfare against a wraith to break it down and basically gain control of its mind is something that they have to practice. They're cruel, manipulative, and vicious, and they were this way even before the diabolization of Cappadocian. Now, of course, when they communicate with the outside world, they look much cruel and horrid. They don't try to show off this darker side to them. It's because the people that deal with the outside vampires and outside world are those specifically chosen to do so, and are the least likely to show off the, the terrible traits which are deep within the clan. Now, ghouling is like an art to them. It's effectively taking someone that's part of the family, that has earned a name for themselves as part of the family, and bringing them into the inner circle. Making them learn about vampires and the supernatural world, shattering them down. So they, again, they've made an art out of this. Oftentimes they try to make these embraces memorable or mind-shattering, and they are very public spectacles to the family. Much the similar way, so is the embrace. The embrace tends to be said by public too. It's made to have this memorable effect on bringing the Giovanni into the family proper. When you become a ghoul, you're effectively a made man. When you become a vampire then you've basically gone up that next level and become an important person in it, an elder of the family. Sadism and weirdness are par for the course for the Giovanni, and most of it seems to stem from the fact that even when they are mortals, they spend much of the time only with the Giovanni family. They rarely even see people from the outside or travel to the outside. They're kind of sh shut off from the world that kind of causes a lot of these problems within them. And then the incest doesn't help either. It seems that this helps kind of cause the arrogance that many of them have, and the fact that they do tend to underestimate the outside world and those from it. Now, they do practice a form of Catholicism, but this is more similar to La Sombra, the fact that it's more in ritual and culture rather than actual practice. What they do practice is a twisted and dark version of Catholicism that is nothing like you would ever really imagine in a normal Catholic ritual. They have a deep connection with the spirit world and with, of course, the dead. They have very casual outlooks on torture, dismemberment, and death. When you're doing this to one person, you can always bring them back as a wraith to interrogate them some more after you've torn apart their physical body. Now, they teach their people of the clan the most efficient tactics to get what you want. Seduction, bribery, and other underhanded tactics are high things to teach members of the family from very early on. Even that's going as far as eliminating by killing the competition if it's really necessary. Now, the family has only effectively had one member, not outside the family, embraced. In the, and this one has been there for 500 years. Mariana. Beyond her, there is no other outside the family that have been embraced and kept. She was embraced for a reason, and so she was basically allowed to stay within the family. As much as she hates them and tries to undermine them at every turn. Traditionally, you are supposed to embrace within the family, and you are supposed to get permission from someone before you are to embrace another from within the family. So permission is important, not necessarily a given, but because being embraced is a revolt of performance, it's a gift, it is a favor that is given to you because you have done so well. Of course, if you're embracing someone that hasn't proven themselves, it's looked down upon, and especially from outside the family. If someone is embraced, they tend to be killed off. Now, the thing is, when Giovanni embrace, they do not traditionally care about generation. That's not as important as joining the family as a member, as a vampire. Granted, lower generation embraces do occur because of performance. If your success was much greater than someone else's success, and both of you earn the right to become a vampire because of this success, then of course, you're going to get a lower generation than the other person. You're going to get a greater gift. Now, Giovanni, as I said, they're very family-oriented. They, though it isn't actually technically uncommon, try to avoid embracing within your family. That means if I am embracing someone, they don't want me to embrace someone from my direct descendants that are still mortals. The reason why is if I do this, I only have their loyalty. I'm basically creating a small dynasty of power within the Giovanni. If I have someone from another branch of the family embrace them, 
than this person that's descended from me, has their loyalty to me because I am their elder within the family. But they also have loyalty to their sire, which is another portion of it. Sort of dividing loyalties and keep making sure that the family remains stable. Not any one group really gains this power. Again, it's not always adhered to, though, but they try to maintain this in order to keep power spread out between the other branches of the family. Now, it is important to note that the Giovanni are the only the independent clan that has the least changes since they were originally introduced. Very few changes have occurred to them over the years. They pretty much remain the same. So that's it for today. I introduce you to the Giovanni, a powerful clan. Powerful in a way. They are an independent clan and have found ways to maintain it using financial responsibilities. It is one of their greater goals to do, gaining finance. But they also seek out necromantic powers for a goal which may undermine all of vampire society. But they are an interesting bit, bunch because they are the youngest vampire clan, having basically diatherized the Cappadocians and then eliminated them, becoming the only. They're a family, a mafia, a business. They also suffer in, on the human side from very dark, very twisted practices from incest to backstabbing, to teaching their children to basically do the most underhanded tactics to get what you want in life. The Giovanni are unique in a way that they've taken some of the darkest traits, even amongst some of the Sabbat clans, and exemplified them greatly in one place. Granted, they are probably not the most horrible clan when it comes to being inhuman, but they do some very terrible things. And as we look towards the modern night, we see that a lot of their great plans aren't going as well as they'd like. This doesn't mean they can't make a turnaround after such terrible things as the Week of Nightmares, the awakening of Ravnos' antediluvian, which caused so much trouble across the world. Perhaps they can still turn things around, complete the goals they always look for. We'll see in the future. So... If you have any questions, comments, anything you want to say, anything you think I left out, please leave in the comments below. Please like, share, and subscribe. It shows your channel, the empire, the work I do. If you want to show some extra support, you can always check out my Patreon. Link in the description below. I will also link it below the White Wolf RPG and media Facebook group that I'm a member of. I do recommend checking them out. They have other great White Wolf material you might want to check out. Maybe be able to find a group or such. Go ahead, check it out. But regardless... Until the next time, I bid you farewell.